Hello, we'll start everyone. recording now. Hi, hi, hi. Hello. Hello. Um, as, as usual, um, one of the things we like to do uh, when we begin these events is ask everybody to start putting in the chat where they are logging into from today. So please go ahead and, and tell us where you're coming to us from today. I got a Scotland, cool. <laughs> Hamburg, Arizona, yeah. Slovakia. Oh my goodness, it's going fast now. <laughs> wow, Italy, <that's> <laughs> all Slovakia. around the world. Ooh, Russia, <laughs> we got a Russian audience. We love it. Wyoming, DC, Portugal. I got to still be in Paris, Paris, Morocco. Salam alaikum, Morocco. Poznan, great. Um, still admitting people. Slovakia, Mexico. Oh, great. Hola. Okay. Hola. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if everyone could could mute themselves, that would be that would be helpful as well. So that we don't have any background noise here, because there's going to be lots of things. Coming yeah. Through. For all those of you joining again, please go ahead and put in the chat where you're logging in from if you haven't done that yet. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, I'll mute. Uh, most people are muted right now, but <coughs> just in case. All right, that's good. That's good. Yeah, Gabriella, cool. You were able to unmute yourself. Claudia, you're gonna need to unmute yourself as well. Mm-hmm, okay. And good, she's done that. Do you guys want to get started? You want to give it a couple more minutes, Gabriella and Claudia? So I think we can oh, okay. start. I'm ready. No problem to start. Everyone's okay. joining. I'm just going to be letting people in and I'm going to zip it. Okay, I'm going to be quiet. Just okay. hello to everyone and wonderful to have so many people interested. Romania. In yeah. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Thank you all for being here at the Expert 21 series. Yes. Yes, it's really great to see everybody. My name is Carrie McKinnon. That was Gabriella Kovacs. Gabriella, can you uh, monitor the waiting room? Just let everybody in. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we are the co-founders of the International Language Coaching Association, and we are so excited to have everyone pulled together today for this very important subject. Um, Claudia and I were just kind of discussing a little bit um, pre-event, we were pre-gaming, and one of the things she said to me is, I'm not a coach, <laughs> I'm a language teacher, and so it, it got us into this headspace of thinking about, you know, this subject is particularly important for us here at the International Language Coaching Association, because we specifically work with language teachers all the time that feel and that know and believe that what they are doing as professionals is not in line with the way they were traditionally taught to teach in our industry. And this is actually why ILCA, as we call ourselves, exists and why we are hosting this um, subject today and using our platform and are collaborating with um, Claudia, who's gonna introduce herself in just a moment, um, to address this whole uh, thing of really what our industry is, is experiencing now and how learner needs have developed. So um, if you're interested in any of the work we are doing at the International Language Coaching Association, please go to our website, www.internationallanguagecoachingassociation.com. <laughs> if you are watching this um, post event, thank you for watching us. To all of you, if you have to leave early while you're here, we'll put this on the YouTube channel. We have a language coaching community where we address these types of subjects and many others that are relevant to language professionals. Um, we have uh, courses, we have eBooks, and we are um, really available, like personally available to you guys to just whatever, to be there along this journey with you of um, transition from teacher to coach. So with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to Claudia now to please introduce yourself. Tell us a bit about yourself and, and how you're here right now with this subject and, um, and jump into your, to your thing. Thank you, everyone. 
Thank you very much for the introduction. So my name is Claudia and uh, I've been an English teacher, not a coach. <laughs> I've been running a language school in Bratislava and I've been a long, um, my lifelong learning has been my hobby since ever, uh, since I was a, I can't say a kid, but a very young, uh, very young lady. Anyway, uh, and that's basically what I would like to talk about is uh, education and role of coaching within education uh, in ELT or EFL in particular. So if you have any questions while I'm speaking, uh, please feel free to ask, feel free to disagree. Uh, I very much welcome. I, th I don't think there is one way that the world works. So there might be things that do not work for you. There might be things that will inspire you. I do hope so. I also hope that I might get some inspiration for myself from you. So I don't really, you know, I'm not here to preach how the world turns, but I'm share with my experience and I'd like to share my, you know, my views. Uh, and I hope to get it a bit of a, you know, reality check from your side. And hopefully we both, we all leave after an hour uh, and reach and inspired. So thank you very much for coming over here. And I'm looking forward to discussing the points with you. So what are we going to talk about? Um, we're going to talk about lifelong learning. Um, and then we're going to talk about ELT as industry and business, and then ELT as space, a platform for us teachers to exist in. And uh, before I start, I'd like to make one thing uh, uh, clear. For me, lifelong learning is um, the same you know, as we keep our, ourselves physically fit. We should eat healthy and exercise and sleep well, and to keep ourselves physically fit and healthy. I believe that lifelong learning keeps us mentally fit and mentally healthy. So, and I also think that, you know, in the past uh, years or decades even, uh, it has been underestimated and our society is not mentally fit as it could be or even should be. So uh, to make it very easy to, uh, to imagine, uh, you know, if you were to uh, have a team to run a marathon, and uh, then you need people who are fit and who are able to uh, who are able to run that marathon, right? And in terms of uh, of learning and teaching, if you had, uh, you also need people who are mentally fit enough to run marathon because their life is changing so fast and the demands are so big, you know, so huge for us. And uh, in a way, because lifelong learning is not really a concept that it's been a lot talked, you know, that it's been discussed for decades, but it doesn't really happening in the real life. And I believe in a way we are very big people <laughs> that, you know, that uh, it would say it would be 300 kilograms people not able to run our mental marathon in general. And, um, and you know, so this is the one, uh, an important part that, uh, an, an important point that I'll be uh, referring back to. So that's, you know, it's for me, it's important that you understand when I talking about lifelong learning that I understand that as being physically and mentally fit in order to do whatever we want to do in our lives. Um, ELT is, for, you know, I'm, I'm run, I'll run a school and I'm a teacher. So, um, and school is a very particular kind of business where you, uh, you are a school for the outside world, but at the same time, you're a company that you have to look inside of your company and think about education you know, in, in your organization. So you are preaching to, to the outside world, but you should make sure that you actually not just preach, but you practice in your inside world. And this is something that is not really happening in ELT or I, you know, that's my experience. CPD has been something that's been a lot talked about, but not, but not very often um, it's been actually exercised uh, in a way that we would expect results and the results would reflect in the practice of teachers and so on and so on. Uh, second point that, you know, pandemic situation has changed the every, or maybe not changed as much as escalated and, and speeded up the whole process. Um, they, they, there's a joke that, you know, says that the best CTO uh, has been COVID because the things that we've been talking about, the whole industry 4.0 and how the world is changing and how the digitalization taking over everything, uh, it's been discussed, but it was very little affecting our everyday lives in reality. And then the pandemic came and it all changed within two weeks. So uh, I quite like the joke about COVID being the, the CTO of the, the best CTO ever. Um, and then the skills of 21st century, uh, and that's something that where 
uh, coaching for me, it's, it's a big part of it. The communication is one of the skills. Uh, and, I, if, and I believe that coaching to a certain level, it's a, com it's a communication strategy, it's a communication tool. And uh, I think we all should learn some of the things at least in order to make our communication more effective. And the last point I'm gonna talk about is the learning ecosystem or a learning environment um, within the company or within the organization, as well as uh, you know, outside in the business world and all, for all our clients uh, and other companies. So, oops, Gabriela, will you tell me if there are any questions? Will you, in the, in the chat, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, since the, uh, I believe, and you might agree or disagree, uh, since the first industrial revolution, where uh, actually the uh, compulsory education started because business needed more people who could read, write and count, and it was necessary for the, for the economy to grow, to have enough people being able to work for the companies as clerks, accountants, and uh, people who are not just phys um, um, skilled technically, but also in terms of the management. And I, I believe that since the first industrial revolution and since the compulsory education, uh, this is the second biggest change we live in. Um, I mean, I'll, I hope I lo live long enough to find out whether I'm right. But um, I see the biggest change in, uh, in the role of a teacher. Uh, and the, the biggest change is that, you know, since, um, since Maria Theresia till now, teacher was the, the source of knowledge. And and teacher was there to disseminate the knowledge, to give it away, you know, to, to teach you stuff. And this has changed because the content and information, A, it's available online on your fingertips anytime. You don't have to remember anymore, you know, when was America, you know, discovered or whatever. You can Google it in within seconds. This is a unique and first time ever situation where this, this is happening. And second of all, the information is changing so fast and the whole, whole economy is moving so fast that what is true today is not going to be true tomorrow. So to teach knowledge is not any more effective because if you don't know what's going to be the job within five years, you can't prepare anymore for that job, right? So, you know, I do believe within 10 years, the whole school system will change and we won't have our vocational schools and university for five years because it won't be possible to put together a program for five years that will prepare people for the future. I mean, it's a bit far stretched, I know, uh, but the point is that um, we have changed the role of a teacher from someone who gives away knowledge to someone who you know, facilitates the process of learning and who helps us to not just to gain knowledge, but rather to work with the knowledge that's there on our fingertips. Well, I'm pretty sure you all know the four 24 century skills. For me, communication includes coaching. As I said at the very beginning, I'm not a coach. I have no aspirations to become one. I truly, I, th I think my coach or my uh, teachers would tell you that I have not even uh, good skills for that. I'm not a very good listener, uh, but I do believe that coaching and my coaching training help me to be a better communicator. And if we talk about ELT, and if we talk about two skills that has been added basically to basic literacy for the upcoming century, that's language and digital skills. So while, I don't know, 200 years ago, we needed to read, write, and um, count, basically, we don't need to do these three things. Content in videos, nobody reads anymore. Uh, we write, I mean, you can use the, uh, re, you know, you speak and the, the, the machine will retype for you. So calculators are used on everyday basis, almost no one counts. So this, the, the literacy has changed. I mean, what we need now that have, for sure is language skills and digital skills, because without those, we have no access to information. I don't know how is it in your countries, but in Slovakia, for example, we are a very small country, 5 million or 6 million people. 60% uh, of internet is currently in English. 0.001% is in Slovak. And we can argue about how much of that is actually still uh, up to date and accurate. 
So without English and without digital skills, you, people will have no access to further education. And it's not just now in pandemic, it's just because the content is, because it's changing so fast, the books are going to be more and more difficult to publish. If you wanna buy a book about marketing, it's almost impossible because by the time they publish the book, it's everything is old. <laughs> so, and, and if we talk about translations, that's not gonna happen. No one's gonna translate anything. So these two skills are extremely important, whether we talk about critical thinking, getting the information you gotta read in English, cooperation, cross-country cooperations, creativity, the same thing. And to be creative in a foreign language, that's not an easy thing. To, to succeed in a business, to succeed in, a, in, a, in your job, just, you know, you are filtering your skills, your abilities through language. And if your language is not good enough, you, you kind of diminish your own skills and your abilities through that language that you use. So, uh, and I, you know, that's why I think that ELT is, is, is an industry. I mean, education, um, I remember when I wanted to, you know, when I started to teach back in 20 years ago, uh, being a teacher was something that, um, well, it's still not, you know, very much respected job. Let's be, uh, let's be open about it. But, uh, you know, it's also not very well paid. So uh, being a teacher was like, okay, if you don't, if you can't do anything else, <laughs> you become a teacher. But what has changed now is the education is number one investment uh, industry for 21st century. So it, education is the, is the basis for the economy to grow at the moment. So, and the language is the communication tool co for cooperation for any of those four skills we, everybody keeps talking about. So unless people have very good English, unless they can be themselves with, you know, speaking English, um, it cuts down their chances to be successful, as blunt as it, as it is. Uh, and I, that's why I think that ELT plays and will play an important role in, in this. Um, there is one thing that needs to be said. It will play important role if it start, if it you know starts to grow and adjust and becomes more critical towards or to, on, to the inside of the of the business, because there, as I, as we were talking about lifelong learning at the very be beginning with an ELT as companies schools there is very little uh, learning happening inside of those companies. Right? If you want a good teacher training takes you a hell of a time to find a good trainer. Uh, so, and there is no evaluation process. There's no measured outcomes, you know. Uh, there, there is no, we, we sell education. And at the same time, we are not really pro-education in our own companies. So I think that's impossible. You know, if you, if you were, you would never go to a hairdresser that has a hair messed up, right? Or you would never buy clothes for someone who wears rags. So what, you know, this is a very big this discrepancy between what we try to sell and what we actually, you know, radiate to the outside world. So the digitalization and uh, technology is going, it's, it's very easy to speed up. It's very easy to buy new software, buy a new computer, you know, that uh, happens from one day to another. I mean, we could have seen that now in the pandemic year, companies that they have problems with security and home office was complicated and not sure if, you know, we can get outside of our intranet. Within two weeks, everybody was out, home office was accepted, the business went on. Technology and, you know, the, the technical stuff uh, is not a big deal. What is more difficult is uh, human resources and learning and development, which uh, in the past decade has been under underestimated, I think. And it was more a service department in a company rather than a department that actually has impact on business. And myself being a business person and being an uh, educational big fan, I think that this needs to change. In this, in this century, HR people are those who are supposed to be sitting on, you know, in the boardroom, in the big table and, uh, and have say. And the question is, if they're able to take their say, that's another another thing and the learning and development is something that is going to affect business of the company very very much and now the question is if the ELT adjusts itself and we are going to be part of the learning and development that makes difference and that has impact or we just simply gonna die away 
this is basically how now learning and development very often looks like. I don't know if you have any other experience, but when I'm talking to clients, I'm talking to other schools, courses are happening in companies. If the company has money, they do invest in education. It's, um, it's a nice thing to have. It's benefit. You know, I, I hate when someone tells me that they're looking for benefit for their employees and they were thinking of English courses. I mean, spa is a benefit, massage is a benefit. But if you send me to a course where I have to learn, how is that how the hell is that a benefit? You know, that's a hard work. That's something that where you have to invest your energy. That's not a benefit. And but it shows that the companies are paying that, but they are not expecting much. So if you pay for a course where there's, you know, people are happy and the feedbacks were good, but there's no impact on business whatsoever. There are two things. First, you're not that much willing to pay. Uh, and the second, you know, it's not going to work because there is no real need. And there is not enough time for us in this world right now to do things that we don't have to or that we that are not necessary with the, our families, kids, jobs, whatever. We have so much on our plate that to fit in something that requires our energy and has no benefit or no tangible benefit, or actually we don't have to do that, it's very, very difficult. So I think this is how it should look like. The courses need to be incorporated in the company and they need to have direct impact on business. And um, as an example, I can, uh, I can talk about coaching because our school has over 50% of students B2 and higher. So we teach people who they speak English, they function in English in their life. And, um, and we were wondering like, what we were actually having problem with was motivation, um, closely, very closely connected with time pressure and time management. And we realized that if we want these people to learn something, uh, if we want to be the teachers, the facilitators of their process, what we need to do, first of all, we want to make sure they're coming to our lessons, that they actually grow their own habit of learning English. And we realized without coaching skills, we are not able to do that. So what we started to do, we trained our teachers and we keep training them. And I'm not saying that all our English teachers are excellent coaches, nor that they all have a vision. But the, the basic skills, you know, asking questions, listening, referring back with a question, asking question again, like the simple one, grow methods, or, you know, just the simple methods, not being, not putting ourselves in a position where we are coaches, are we going to save your life and your business and everything? No, just to be more in the uh, in listening than speaking in those lessons and helping those people overcome all the hurdles that they life gives them on everyday basis. And when we started with training, uh, I think it was three years ago, and with a clear business, you know, uh, intention. So it was directly linked to their evaluation talks. It was linked to our sales. It was for us as for school and for business, it was crucial that our business, our, you know, CPD, our learning and development shows us the results. So we were doing everything to, to, to enable our teachers, to give them time, to give them space, to, to make sure they earn enough so they have their, uh, their bills away, you know, away from their heads and they actually have space for learning and development for themselves. And uh, because we, we needed to do that because three years of investment into their growth uh, needs to show in our business and on our sales curve. And this all interconnected was motivating me, motivated me to be, to give more space to them. It was motivating them to learn because they could see that if they learn and they'll be better, they earn more and so on and so on. It was helping our clients. We changed, um, before pandemic, we had 80% of attendance rate. And in pandemic, we only dropped to 75. So people are coming to our lessons. They see the value. They see that they learn there and they are willing to pay because they are getting back the, the you know what they're paying for it's not a nice thing to have an English lesson it's an essential thing to have an English lesson because if I have my English lesson today uh, the teacher will help me with the stuff I need to do or simply I will feel I'll improved and that's what people are willing to pay for I think that um, actually I keep saying uh, pay for and money but I think that um, 
or what I see from our clients, it's not money, it's time that's much valuable for them. So is it I'm paying for a lesson, but am I going to waste that time? Am I going to waste that an hour? You know, I already paid at the beginning of the month. So now the decision is not any more money because that's been paid. The decision is, am I going to have an English lesson now tired or am I going to have a glass of wine? And, you know, and if your student have this decision making, you know, they, they, if they do it, uh, making the decision every single time, you have a problem because what you need to do is to get them to a point where there is no hesitation. They go for a lesson. They know there's going to be value and the time is worth the effort. So it's very, this is very important. And I think that the first thing, if schools are starting to look into inside and they are starting to think about learning and development in their own uh, business, in their own company, then they will see it differently also from the perspective of their clients who, you know, business is business. So there is no, we all need to earn money. So when we were uh, setting up this, this, this is basically the last part of my, of my presentation. It's, uh, there are six things I'm going to talk about that I believe are important in according, uh, in, in, um, to create this, we call it learning ecosystem. So what everything you need for your, whether students or your own employees, if, they, if you're growing them and you're trying to help them develop. Yeah. So the first uh, and number one is uh, values in the company. It sounds like a buzzword, uh, but it's not. And uh, to lead by example. When we, last year, when we switched online, um, it was, a, now looking back, it was different back then. We, were, we, we all were on an on a adrenaline rush, working like crazy. But looking back, um, uh, when we looked back in May or June and we did our little evaluation, we realized that because uh, our teachers are used to learn, they have their own, de own development plans, they do have to do stuff and I keep nagging them and you know, they, they, there is still something they have to do. And in a way uh, they got used to it. So they know that every year I come up with something new and you know, and they moan a little and they do a little and you know, we all kind of go through the year. And this time when, when the pandemic hit and we had to move online, I was, to be frank, I was an observer because it was it, they, they, by themselves. They were like, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. And we had a big meeting and they came up with an action plan and they were learning like crazy. They were teaching, but they were learning like crazy. They were sharing, they were, you know, helping each other. They created the little teams based on what they teach. And it was amazing to watch. Um, I, I, I didn't realize it then because I was doing other stuff, but looking back, it was really, really amazing. And I think this is important because if you have this kind of environment, where everybody is an example for the others, then they, they, these people will help you go through those periods, which we all have them. If you don't, you know, don't feel like learning new stuff and you fed up and you're not happy and, you know, uh, and you are in your dark place or, or, you know, flat place or whatever, but then you have this, you know, people around you that help you go through that. I believe it's the same thing as if you teach a group instead of individual and you know you have a student who is lazy but the others will push him a little bit you know and then he catches up and and the things move uh, the direction we want it to move hiring process it's a, a first first step for the new person to come in and it's extremely important it's extremely important that the person who is responsible for recruitment has the same values as you as the one who leads the school or someone who is responsible for the school. And I don't mean val the proclaimed values. I mean values that you have inside as a human being. Because uh, one thing that pandemic has showed us, uh, you know, you, you keep reading, or uh, for myself, I've kept re uh, reading about how important values are, but I never really understood what, you know, the practical side of it. Uh, but looking back when we were learning from the, the, in summer, when we were reflecting back on our pandemic first months, we realized that in, you know, when you got under stress and when you get under pressure, you go back to what you feel is right. And if you're, you know, if you personally believe that it's right and to be responsible and to work hard uh, instead of to run away, then this program kicks in. 
So I didn't have to worry about what my team will do because they were responsible for themselves and for the school, but because that was their natural program. That was something that they were, they grew up with, they were brought up by their parents or simply they have the values regardless the school. If they were working for another company, it would be the same thing, that's themselves. So when you're hiring new people, it's extremely important that you have this concord on, on a value level because that's something that you can't tell people to do. If they don't believe it's right, they're not gonna do it, especially not in a stressful situation. Um, so the, another thing is to, uh, of course, if you, you need to encourage sharing because that's what, you know, they say that we are a mix of five people we tend to meet most often. So I think if, we ask, we, if you help them to create, whether it's your student in your group or it, it's, a, you know, it's your teacher team in school, you, the sharing knowledge and helping each other and encouraging each other, it's extremely important to create an atmosphere where you want to learn. Having a coffee with someone in a kitchen and learning about great book, that's the best way, that's the highest chance that you actually get that book and you will read it. Even better if your colleague takes the book out of his, you know, of his bag and says, this is what I've read, read it, it's really, really good. I mean, I'm pretty sure that if you're not going to read a book, you, at least you're going to live through and you learn something new. So this is very important because it it's not something that's external, like this is me and my life. And here is something I need to learn in order to grow in my, you know, in my job. It's become integral part and I enjoy it. And if I don't enjoy it, I'm not doing it. I just have a coffee and I go off to, from the kitchen. L&D program, and, and this is where coaching kicks in very, very much is uh, one thing is to draw this lovely or to write a lovely L&D program for your school or for your client. Yeah, the client comes in and they want to and they want you to help them to improve their English because they want to grow as a company and reach to other markets. If the L&D program is it needs to be written meaningfully. So first of all, you have to do a very good needs analysis. For that, coaching is essential. You have to be able to ask the right questions. You have to be able to listen to answers, decode the answers, because as they say, they know what they want, but you know what they need. They come to you, they come to school, they come to coach because they need your guidance. If, if there is no guidance, why would they come? I mean, you know, if they knew what to do, they don't need a teacher, they don't need a coach. So to, to, to help them reach their goals, and to help them to, sh to write their plan that will fit their personality and their needs, and it will actually work for them, it's very, very crucial. And for that, I can't, honestly, I can't really imagine how it happens if the person is not uh, capable of at least some coaching. The better the coach, I think the more quality there is in that program. And then individual plans and coaching. So we have a big program that basically needs to be in concord with the business plan of the school or the company. Uh, and then you break it down to individual plans. And there you need to help with the support uh, and coaching of individual people. I think that what is underestimated um, when new courses, whether it's language or anything else happen, people tend to talk a lot about the content of the course and goal of the course. But there is uh, what is neglected is the part where we are building our new habit we are changing our daily routine. So for me, for example, I started to walk a more while being in quarantine or being under lockdown. And uh, I started to walk. So, uh, but it, it's not just about walking and going out. It's about managing my daily uh, workload in a different way. It means eating in a different time because I go and I walk in the evening. So I have to make sure I finished working enough uh, early enough to prepare my dinner, to eat my dinner, and then to go out. And if I do not manage these things, or I go out hungry, or I eat at 11 when I get back. So, you know, and this is underestimated. It's not just about getting new course, it's about adjusting your daily routines. And that's very, very difficult. It's basic to build a new habit, what you're tackling with. And, you know, and I think that the first part of every new course, the first, you know, intro, two, three weeks. It's about making clear to your student, to your clients, to your teacher, that he or she is building up a new habit that, you know, takes extra effort. That's, and, and you can't expect your results from learning new language because first month, we're only going to focus 
on you know ha your habit, your enjoyment, your motivation, your plans, and you can't. It's the, I tend to compare it to losing weight. You know, if you go to a fitness center and you have a sexy trainer, or it does help, that's for sure. But his six pack doesn't affect me, right? I can look at him or her, but it doesn't mean I'm going to lose weight. So that's first thing. And the second, if I go there twice a week and then I'm eating chips at night, doesn't going to help. So it's the mere fact of paying for a course. It's nothing. It's, it's, it's really, it's nothing. So there's no shortcut. And the student has to be aware of that because it's going to be hard work. And I think if this is made clear at the very beginning when the motivation is on the highest point and you made that person realize this is not going to be a piece of cake it's going to be tough work but on the highest peak of motivation everything seems easier so and then then you have a you know you make an anchor to which the student goes back and when you have a tough time um and this is very individual but that's why how it works for me i kind of remember but this is what you want it so go for it right so if, but if you don't have this anchor point solid enough then it feels like ah, oh, you know ah, I, was, I wasn't sure then and I'm not sure now and it actually seems very difficult and you know too many things I have to change and that that not having that that anchor point solid makes a lot more complicated than to keep on going with whatever you decided to learn and of course reviewing uh, uh, rewarding and recognition and success everybody wants to be successful and success for taste it's you know it's a great taste so if you if you get that people through a person through the first hurdles and then you make them feel the success it helps you to keep new kick off motivation for another period of time so and then you know it, it's uh, I, I see it as waves you know you you get this kick of motivation, then you go in on that wave, and then when it starts to fall down, you make sure you got a kick again, and then you go on a wave, and you know again and again. So I think that it's the reward is very important. Whether you talking about a reward as a coach, but a much much bigger reward is if we talk about a company. You know, if you because the, what is really uh, the recognition for people who are learning new stuff is that something in their real life is better. It's not tap on the shoulder from your teacher. That's nice. That's that's you know, kind of a um, thing to do. Uh, but but what is real reward is if you feel that you are something is easier, something is smoother, something's better in your life. So whether is it that you suddenly can read the news, or you wanted to watch movies, or suddenly you don't feel. Um, I remember we had a we had a HR lady who said that she wants her people not to you know uh, check on their phones when they are meeting their foreign uh, colleagues in a corridor so the moment when you feel confident enough to say hi and you're not worried that the person is going to ask you something so you rather check your phone as you walk so if this is the goal and then suddenly you feel more comfortable that's what needs to happen in order to have that recognition and reward that's the real recognition it's, it can't be something so you know made up and artificial so yeah, so the whole ecosystem, it's, I, I like the world because uh, I think that it's, you know, it has so many things and so many, um, so many things are different for all, all of us that there is no one matrix or one recipe that we can use and that's going to work. It's, you know, we have humans on the one side and humans on the other side. We have teachers, we have students and how they will get together uh, it's always different. So what brings them together is always different. So I think what we need to be good is, you know, good listeners and good decoders. So we'll find a way to match both sides. And I think this uh, is for ELT more for than any other company. <laughs> but it's basically, yeah, change is not necessary. Survival is not mandatory. So there is no, it's the same for me. Uh, ecological issues are very close to my heart. And if people talk about climate change, it's not the, the earth that's, you know, that's worried about what's going to happen. It's us humans, because the earth is going to be here with us or without us. It's our concern that we stay alive uh, and we do not fr get fried. So I think that this is the same with ELT. It's not necessary for us, you know, it's to survive. We, we might not, but I think that we can 
if we listen to what the world needs, if we, you know, and if we are ready to deliver what business requires us to. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm muting now. Thank you very, very much. I think everyone is kind of just sitting here and like, wow. <laughs> so thank you very much. We've had a pretty active, you know, chat box here. And I'm just just looking at it here. Quite a lot of things going on here, especially around the wine. But there, there are also some other very productive ideas here about how the attitude to learning, how the attitude to the, you know, the role of the teacher has to uh, slowly evolve. And uh, also, uh, what, what else do we have? And, and we're very happy to see any questions coming up here, okay? So uh, how it, it important it is to, for the learners to have goals, you know, for them to identify goals and uh, to see, uh, you know, the change that they, they can actually make and for the teacher to understand how they can be supporting. That's where the coaching can come in. Um, also, the fact that, um, you know, what, what kind of, uh, you know, my, it was my, my idea, but, you know, what return on interest coaching can add to teaching. So how, how we can specify that. And uh, what else is going on here? I'm um, just looking here. If I may, Gabriela, I, I, you know, I had this comment on our Facebook page. I don't think that there is teaching or coaching. I believe that that's an integral part of the process <laughs> because teaching is very, very broad as the same way as learning is very, like what is, I mean, teaching, learning is even if you walk out and you see something nice and you learn about new stuff outside, learning's happening all the time it can be formal it can be informal happens in a gallery uh and i think teaching is the same way it can be our neighbor who teaches us something while we are taking out our dustbin it's it's happening all the time i think coaching is a very effective technique that helps us to to facilitate that process more effectively basically yeah okay i understand what you say so coaching is a discipline and if you use certain techniques and tools it can strengthen your teaching, definitely. Um, and I think it can be an integral part. Uh, what, what I call it is uh, coaching approach teaching. So you can teach without having a coaching approach, but that's going to be that very traditional. This is where I hurt people, but I'm sorry. That's, <laughs> that's that very traditional kind of teaching that you were talking about, which evolved from the first industrial revolution. And, and you know, it right into, I think, into the middle of the, the 20, 20th century. It was something very, very evident. But after a while, that just kind of has evolved and changed into something which we call, you know, coaching or teaching or, you know, whatever you want to call it. And I totally agree with it that um, that coaching is something that has to filter, infilter our uh, communication. So it's not only about teaching, it's just, just the way that we communicate. Are we listening to each other? Are we asking enough questions? Right? So that, that's also something that we we can be, you know, looking at, and uh, I'm, I'm looking now, uh, yeah, at the at the chat here. So we've got a question here, um, Claudia. Can you see it, or should I read it out? If you can read it out, that would be helpful because I only can see half of it, and it's so. Right. Okay. Okay. I'm I'm fine with that. Okay. So you've described the importance of teachers developing themselves further and continuously throughout their career. Um, and the role of the institution in facilitating such an environment. My question is how to do that specifically or what, what to focus on specifically. Okay, so it's about CPD. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I don't know, in, it can be different in different uh, institutions, but how it worked for us uh, is that we, first of all, we started to use Cambridge, of, um, Cambridge framework for teachers. We found it quite good for to, to kind of find out who is in our team. And uh, we used it for two years. This is the third year we used it. And, uh, and we actually kind of monitored who we have on our team, what kind of teachers, what the scales are. And then we, uh, we decided 
what the team needs to work on, where are our weaknesses as a team, as a whole group. And that's where we came up with coaching. And we said, this is something that everybody's going to benefit from. There was a cross, you know, uh, team something. And then we, based on that, we, you know, we introduced trainings, for example, uh, I tested, I used to work before with the volunteers. And one thing that I've learned is that how much environment shapes your motivation, but also your um, perception of yourself. And so what we started to do, we have a week a long holiday, we call it holiday, where we have sessions uh, and we live with trainers for a week. And it gives you, or uh, to our teachers, I believe that uh, that's that what really worked, that you're sitting there with your trainer recently we've been working uh, with Philip Kerr, for example, and you listen to them over a glass of wine and you can, you know, being a teacher, being an intelligent person, you suddenly see where you need to develop. You see your weaknesses. No one has to tell you that you have to work on that. You can see that. You see better people, you aspire to them. They are your role models. You naturally kind of drag to those better people. So being there with a week, within a week with them, I think it gave a good feedback to all our teachers to realize uh, you know that the fact that they're getting very good feedback from their students doesn't mean too much because they the students are not professionals to judge their job you know and we had a lot of discussions about raising salaries based on good feedback and then of course automatic comes in questions do you want to decrease your salary if the feedback's not good you know <laughs> so and 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 we realized that that to have happy students is a mere necessity, but it does not tell you how good a teacher you are. Because sometimes you have students who are not nice, sometimes you have students who are super nice, you know, and it's not what shows you how good teach. Sometimes you have students who will learn like this, sometimes you work like hell and nothing's changing. So I think that you need someone extra who is who is better than you are in teaching and methodology to help you and to guide you through that process. And, and it's not about coming to a kind of a one state where everybody's good because a teacher can be good for one person and not good for another person. So it's about matching teachers and students, about bringing them, growing mm -hmm. them to their own potential, basically. That's what we would like to do. Right. And there, of course, I'm not sure how much we're succeeding. So that would be our teachers to tell, but that's what we aspire for. So we used coaching within our mentoring sessions with our, with our teachers and we're trying. And as I said, I'm not coach myself. So I'm learning myself. My director of study is learning and we are trying to, to be able to find out what is it that our teacher are in, teachers are interested in and what is it they actually need. Not mm -hmm. what they tell you they need, but what is it that will motivate them to work on themselves. Yeah. Because keep in mind that business plan behind, it's not for me, it's not important to say that we have mentoring sessions, we have that, we have that, we have that. I'm actually not interested in that. What I'm interested in is, are my teachers better at the end of the year or not? And if not, we have to redo the stuff. If yes, okay, we are on the right track, let's move on. But for me as a business person, the overall outcome is what matters. Everything else are just steps towards that. So the, the kind of a circle thing where we, we are making sure that we are on the right track and people are developing is extremely important. And this is something I lack in education as such. There is no, if something goes wrong, we tap on, you know, shoulder, the students are happy, everybody's happy. That doesn't have any value. We're not there to make them happy. We're there to make them learn. Yeah, I think that's a very, very strong but very relevant statement. And I think what, what coaching can help in, in these processes for the teachers, but also the learners, is to help them to be much more focused. So basically saving time. So not going into unnecessary courses when they don't actually need a certain kind of course, but actually they would need different kind of skills development as a student. And the same for teachers. They might think that they need some kind of methodology, you know, specific methodology to increase what their what, what their their value is as a teacher, when in fact what they would need to do is improve their communication skills, quite honestly, because, you know, there's a wide, wide range. And I've seen great teachers with terrible communication skills, like the way that they, you know, just send an email to me or mm. 
how they they you know they start the lesson like okay good morning and then you know just just getting into it which is you know it, it's great it's wonderful and as a student you can kind of understand that okay we're getting down to business but on the other hand from you know the soft skills or communication skills perspective it's not adequate it's not enough now so those four c's are there for a reason so communication is a huge big thing and we're there as role models as teachers in a way well i even think that you know taking from psychology um that we as teachers should be spending more time learning you know stuff from psychology because the moment for example if you're there first i mean we had these discussions with my teachers about being in classroom five minutes early uh, and because then your students are coming into your space, whereas if you last arrive into room, you're coming to their space. And, uh, and that's just the basic psychological thing, but it has, you know, it puts your, it gives you a different status, give, puts you in a different situation. And I think these things matter because it's all about psychology when it comes to learning. It's, you know, it's not really, I wish it worked like I'll told you so you should know, but it doesn't work like that. I mean, my personal it, big interest is in what actually makes us learn. What is it that sometimes we remember things and sometimes we don't? So what, you know, how is, how does our brain work? And as a, being a school owner, what I'm always interested in is something that uh, we can do and influence people without, act, you know, asking them to take an active part in it. It might sound crazy, but for example, one thing is that you come to an English lesson and there is free tea and coffee. So even if you're hungry or you're cold, you can actually satisfy your needs and be more ready to learn rather than you are you thinking about, you know, your empty stomach and then you can't simply focus. So right. you, to think about those things that as, a, as an institution or as a teacher, you can do and it will affect your students, whether they realize that or not. So I think that, you know, it's, I'm, not, I'm not saying it always helps, but those are little things that if combined together, uh, they do make difference. Well, I mean, if you feel good, then you're more, more open to new ideas. And if, you know, it's like basic, you know, Maslow hierarchy. I mean, if, if you've got issues with the first two or three, you know, layers of, of, that, of that pyramid, then you're not going to be moving towards self-actualizing. Exactly, exactly. Like, Maslow is my favorite. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> If you're cold, if you're hungry, you're not going to be learning, right? <laughs> Definitely, yeah. All right. Um, there is a question here, okay? Maybe there are more, but I'm, I'm looking here at one. Um, Alexandra asks, could you give some more information on how you implement learning English to L&D programs within the companies? Well, um, there was a similar question asking about how to shift from benefits to investment. I mean, that's something, you know, I've, uh, I have no... Uh, no answer to like not a good answer or at least I don't think I have a good answer because I um, I keep saying that uh, pandemic gave me a huge lesson it's a it's a very tough but a good teacher and one thing I've realized uh, with my own team uh, and it has affected our business strongly and this is something that I'm telling my clients or my potential clients as an example is that we've been able to go through pandemic and I'm strongly believe that it's because our teachers are used to learn new things. And learning new things basically means being disciplined, being used to work hard, being able to work in team, being able to cope with your mistakes, stepping out of your comfort zone. And these things are micro trained when you're learning new things. Or, you know, you have to go through those little processes so when the pandemic hit, basically these things become suddenly important. And if you have those microprocesses pre-trained, then you cope easier. Uh, I, I have no research that would actually back my, or no, not much data to back my opinion, uh, but going through the, those three months and seeing those teachers being more or less okay, not needing any mindfulness trainings or yoga trainings, being okay and being able to talk to us and coping with the stress they had uh, and still being able to be there for, for students to, to the level that students were happy with lessons uh, gave me a proof for myself that it worked, that, you know, that for them, it was suddenly a different situation. I, I haven't asked them, but I, I, I think that it actually might have been easier for them because suddenly it wasn't me telling them, now you have to do this and this is the plan for this year. Suddenly it was obvious necessity. You know, there was no question they have to do that. So 
each one of them realize like this is what it is and this is what we have to do. So when I talk to a company, I believe that the importance is that the management actually is um, is, is uh, the leaders or the role models for learning. And uh, looking into the online, LinkedIn produced a very interesting report for 2020, how online, uh, online platforms are actually affecting the world of education. Mm -hmm. And one thing they said, uh, are the biggest threats of having all, whether it's Udemy or Coursera or whatever, is that uh, they call it leadership championship. So if you have, if the, if the company head or the manager is not the person who serves as an example, the whole le the learning development program is falling apart because it's like, you know, if I'm preaching you to, to, to learn and I'm not doing anything myself, it's very difficult to believe that it's important for the company because if it was important for the company, I would have to be the first to learn, <laughs> right? I mean, even if you do not put the finger on it subconsciously, it's like, you know, if someone tells you go and exercise and they eat chips, I mean, if it was important, if your doctor would be, you know, too big and preaching you about keeping healthy diet, would you take him seriously? I mean, consciously and, and you know, like uh, cognitively, probably yes, but then on the other level, you wouldn't, right? And this is what they, what comes up from this big LinkedIn research that unless there is a head of a company who has true respect for education, it's very difficult to explain that person that 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 actually education is not benefit, but it's an investment. It's a I, I would say it's actually a value thing. My, I might stretching it a bit too far, but I think you have to have it as value. Well, value, and you know, you you want to be the change that you want. You know, so if if you are not open to change, then then nothing's going to happen. And I think it's it's all about you know having sort of shared responsibility. So. I'm responsible for you, but you are also responsible for me in a way within an organization. Yes. And if we're, we're looking at a learning development department in a company, that's even more so true. But, you know, it, there, there's so much dialogue conversation about what true leadership is now yes. and how that's affecting and impacting lower down. And it's yes. also true for a language school, you know, I mean, it's a business <laughs> like any other. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. I mean, if, if you represent, you know, this is what we do. We've been doing this for 20 years. We've been teaching, sorry, headway for 30 years and it's great. We love it. Then, you know, learners are going to feel like, well, it's kind of the same thing over and over again. And we're, we're not really, we're, we're learning, but we're not really learning. Yeah. Well, I think psychologically, if, you know, I don't think a teacher has potential to inspire someone to learn to, to, for learning unless the person learns itself or himself or herself. You simply, I don't believe you have that vibe. You know, it's like if you don't read, uh, I, I think it's the same way as if you look at the kids in families. They say that, you, you know, to bring up kids, it's enough if you live well and then they will copy. And I think it's the same in a way with teachers who you are reflects you know and influences your your students and there is no good or right because we all have different personalities and different students will like us and different students will not like us that much but i think that we influence our students and if we learn and we read and it comes out of us it naturally comes out i don't think we can fake this mm -hmm. Yeah, although we do know this, fake it till you make it, but that's not true for every context. <laughs> I think that's not where we can do it. Um, one more thing um, that we have here is interesting. What resources you found helpful around the question of memory and retention? I know it's a different area, but is is there anything I don't know or any source? I mean, uh, that you think is is useful for this this kind of. <laughs> Yeah, there, there we are. There's the leader. Okay. I'm looking, I'm looking for what you it's here. It's, uh, it's Tony Buzan. It's, um, he's got really good books. I can send you the links. Um, it's about mind maps and memory and, you know, lots of exercises. And then I uh, also read some stuff on seniors because we have around 70, well, no, now we have 40 seniors online studying English. And, um, and that made me interested because we had a lady who was 85. And she was and she was improving in language, no problem. And I realized, and, and it's, again, it's just you know my uh, my experience is not backed by data, but uh, that made me interested in memory and brain. And I realized that the people who used to be used to learn all their life, so usually doctors or lawyers, lawyers pretty good with their brains, 
uh, it's a muscle like any other because when they grow, you know, when they were in the 70s, they had less problems to adapt to a course and learn than someone who was 20 and not learning. So it's not, I mean, of course, age is, uh, I'm not saying age is no difference, you know, but it does have a cha uh, effect, but it's, it's not the determination of your, your brain capacity. So that would make me um, learn about the brain a bit more. Mm. And for example, um, uh, one thing that's really interesting is I'm vegetarian for a very long time. And my teachers could tell you that I'm a Nazi, you know, when it comes to meat so we, we we don't pay meat uh any you know wherever we go we have vegetarian food and uh, i had this theory uh, six years ago when we started with mark andrews and frank prescott uh we started the first camp where we had vegetarian food and uh, uh, i was curious whether the teachers will uh, have higher level of engagement and actually more concentration and they did and since then i've been i keep asking my trainers are they more, more attentive? And they are because we have our trainings in summer. It's 35. Uh, people tend to, if you eat heavy food and then you tr tend to drink a lot of coffee, your digestions get stuck. And that's for sure that happens. <laughs> and when your digestion is stuck, your brain slowly is losing the energy because you need to make your digestion work. So food reflects, you know, in what you, how your, how your, how your brain works. I mean, we all had, you know, uh, lunch coma after. <laughs> so I think, you know, all of these things affect brain. And, um, and for me, that's super interesting, you know, to, to mm -hmm. talk to other people, whether they learn better in the morning or in the evening. And it, it's not, uh, not universal for everyone, but it's important to know what works for you personally, because that affects the effectivity of learning, the, the time you spend learning and how much you actually get out of it. If I had a lesson at seven o'clock, I'm pretty sure that I wouldn't even remember the teacher. So I'm not having lessons at seven o'clock. So I think this is very important that people are aware of what is important for them. And food is extremely important, extremely effective, affects your, your um, concentration level. Right. And I think that that's a trigger word for anyone who's uh, even slightly familiar with coaching that uh, it increases awareness at various levels awareness of yourself and I think we're tying back to the beginning of the conversation that we've had today which is being very aware being very conscious of uh, who you are not only mentally but also physically and the two connect and this food coma kind of thing is is you know a very typical example of that you know if you eat very heavy stuff then you just can't concentrate it's I think that's very very universal and and there's nothing to do about that but I'm, I'm just looking at the chat here in in the meantime if there's anything towards the end here um that we have um about accountability um what else do we have uh yeah people wanting to get in touch with you getting wanting to get in touch with us so that so <laughs> that we, we have all those things and, and general comments on, you know, uh, yeah, food coma. Yeah, okay, good. So I think we're pretty good. If, if anyone wants to just, I don't know, um, feedback, comments, uh, any any ideas that you have, we're, we're slowly going to be wrap, wrapping up, okay? Because, you know, we, we try to keep the one hour limit, but we're, <laughs> um, I think this, is, this has been a, a really um, great adventure because you were bringing so many different ideas and tying them together. And I think it's it's really impactful. Some people were saying this was one of the best um, CPD events they've had for many years. So oh, thank you. That's <laughs> really very good, nice. Really good <laughs> feedback. Okay. So if you can just put in, uh, okay, I'm going to do a bit of coaching on a scale of one to 10, how useful or how relevant you found today. One where you'd say it's nothing special. 10, it was absolutely great and very useful. If you, you can just put in a number into the chat box, okay, between one and 10, where are you? Nine, wonderful. Okay, nine, nine. Okay, a teacher is never going to say 10. Okay, don't. Oh, we've got, a 10. we've got a 10, 10, 10. We've got 10. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> Eight, very good. Nine. Okay, wonderful. So we're, we're getting really, really good um, figures here. So that's the kind of feedback that uh, I was expecting. <laughs> so thank you very much. A 10 again. Okay, so wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Any, any closing thoughts, uh, Claudia? What, what did you think of the questions that came up for you? 
Well, uh, I think that, you know, it would be very much interesting to meet you all in person and to have, you know, to have those chats. It's the, the one thing that I, you know, I don't mind online at all, surprise, surprise, but, you know, these are the situations where I would love to sit with you in one room and to have that, you know, discussions, maybe heated discussions about the things, because uh, I don't think that, you know, there is one uh, universal answer to anything. It's always, it's always about, uh, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm a true believer in measuring things in education, but measuring not in terms of, of results, but of, in, you know, when we talk about indicators. So I think it's important to have indicators to see whether we're going the right direction, but we need to be very careful about not being slaves to the numbers, because it's never really just about the numbers. So thank you very much for, for you know, being my audience. Thank you very much for the feedback. I'm glad I uh, have a place to improve, <laughs> and uh, and I do hope I'll meet you sometimes in a you know in a conference or somewhere where we have more space and more human chat. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time, for your commitment to this whole topic, and uh, thank you everyone for being here, whether it's early morning or late in the evening, for everyone it's completely different and uh, we did they have that time change, but uh, yeah, thank you very, very much and uh, hope to see you soon. We do have this, uh, this uh, talk in a series, the um, ILCA Expert 2021 series every month. We had it for last year, it was then called Expert Series 2020, funnily enough, yes, so we've changed the title for this year. And uh, we plan to go on every single month. We've always got a great speaker like Claudia, not, not as good as Claudia, but obviously still quite intriguing um, speakers. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you there. And if you want to get a bit more interested in what coaching, language coaching really can do for a language teacher or, or a professional, you know, interested in, you know, adding coaching skills, then hop onto our website and have a look at what's going on there. We've, we've uh, you know, rearranged a few things, lots of exciting things coming up. So we're really looking forward to seeing you there so that we can have more personal conversations, I think, because we, we could go on and on here, I think, for two more hours, but we've just got a time limit, so we have to stop here. So, <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for being here, for hopefully enjoying yourselves, and uh, see you somewhere soon, okay? So thank you very much. We'll be thank you. Bye-bye. Have okay, a nice bye. evening. Okay, Bye. thank you very much. Okay. All right.